morning, everyone. I hope you all slept well. However, I realize that some of you may have continued networking last night. So I would like to see a show of hands if there are those that continued to network last night. Okay. Excellent. So I want to thank the organizers for providing a great opportunity to continue our networking. We know how important that is at an event like this. It's always through serendipity that you'll meet somebody that you didn't know, that you'll plant some seeds for future partnerships or relationships. So just in the spirit of that, we'd like to continue just for a moment networking. I would like you to look around, identify somebody you don't know, and introduce yourself, and basically provide an example of an aha moment that you've encountered over the last few days at the e-learning conference that you'd like to share with somebody else. Now to keep on time, class, to keep on time, before we do this, you only have five minutes. And then you'll hear me going like this to sit back in your seat. So thank you. So I want to I want to thank you for uh, indulging me as the opportunity. You unleash people to network, and what are you going to do? So thank you, everybody, for your attention. We appreciate your joining us today, everybody. Well, thank you so much. Now, bear in mind, you still have a few more hours to meet other people here just to let you know, to take advantage of the great resources that are in this room. My name is Anthony Bloom. I'm the executive director of the Mobiles for Education Alliance. And it's my great privilege to be asked to chair a panel with such tremendous and inspirational speakers. I want to start by acknowledging the contributions of our colleagues from ministries, including the Honorable Minister from ICT and Telecommunications, Paula Ingebere, that is joining us today, but all the other Ministry of Education officials and colleagues that are with us, you are our superheroes. Notwithstanding how challenging it is, regardless of the setting, to bring forward young lives in your countries, the fact that we had trying times with COVID-19 made it even more challenging. So truly, our great acknowledgement for the work of the governments and the officials that are here, and I think they deserve a round of applause. I also want to thank the organizers, Rebecca, Rosa, all the colleagues that were involved in putting on an event. The M Education Alliance, we put on our own annual event in Washington, D.C., and we know how much time it takes to organize an event this spectacular with hosts as amazing as our Rwandan government colleagues. So great thanks to the organizers for putting together this event. So we'll have, I'll introduce our presenters and then invite them to come up and speak. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. So please make note of comments or insightful aha moments that come from our presenters so that we can include that as part of our presentations. We're gonna start with Lady Miriam Jame. Um, I gotta turn my timer off, sorry. Um, Lady Miriam Jame, first of all, just having the pure pleasure of sitting with these colleagues for half an hour in the room, just finding out about all their amazing work was really a, a privilege. So Lady Marianne Jame is an award-winning technologist. Just listen to her resume. A podcaster and a pioneer in system change. She's also a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. And in September 2017, she won the Innovation Award at the Global Goals Award as a goalkeeper for her work in advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. By supporting globally young women and girls, businesses, and governments. She's Senegalese-born, a French-British businesswoman with over 20 years of experience in the technology sector. She's best known for her motivational and inspirational speeches about girls' education through STEAMED, 
which was terrific. I had not heard that acronym before. I'd heard STEAM, with science, technology, engineering, math, arts, and design. So I hope if she doesn't mention it as part of her presentation, that one of you in the audience is going to ask for more specifics about the design component, because I'm really interested in that. Um, she has traveled extensively in refugee camps to teach girls how to code, how to code, and she's on the board of directorship of the World Wide Web Foundation and the newest board member of the ITU Generation Connect Visionary Board. She's writing her first book, and if that wasn't enough in, like, in speaking with her, she also has a program called I Am The Food. And again, if somebody's clever, potentially to ask uh, Lady Miriam about that, it's fascinating the work that she's done. So I'd like to invite Lady Miriam to please join us, maybe with a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. You can play the video. Before the video comes, I want to thank eLearning Africa and thank you, Rebecca, and your team for bringing this amazing conference into our continent and doing it in a very consistent way since 2005. So thank you so much. You have our endorsement as Africans. Thank you. What is I Am The Code? I Am The Code is, is a global movement. Its aim is to mobilize government, private sector, philanthropic foundations, and businesses to advance STEM education. And when we say by, by STEM education, we mean uh, science, uh, technology, engineering, mathematics, art, and design. We're now in 68 countries, and so far we taught 18,000 girls how to code. It is really important to learn how to code. I'm a full stack developer, so I'm a coder. Coding helps them with their computational thinking. There's a different way of thinking. You can see the difference between the girls who are coding and the girls who are not coding. Their brain has changed. You know, they can decompose information. They understand what I'm talking about. But the other aspect also is I want them to know they are the code. They have the potential to change their lives. It's really important that girls understand what coding is. Uh, there are so many, many coding languages. But at the same time, I really believe that in this world right now, we don't talk about humanity that much. We don't talk about, as human beings, what we can do to change things. The I am the code aim is to make sure you are a coder, a full stack developer, a coder who understands the problem of humanity. Girls' minds are changing systematically. They're thinking about, you know, now I want to do climate change issues, but I need to also recycle plastic. They understand what the information is about and they take it further with their communities and other girls. That's why you see this enthusiasm and this smartness and this intelligence in their mind. Well, the Kakuma girls are really special to me because when I came for the first time, I, I just realized that I, just I had a similar life to them. I'm not a refugee, I'm not but, a refugee but I've definitely suffered as a definitely young girl. As a young uh, growing up in uh, Senegal, up I, didn't Senegal I didn't have attention, I didn't have attention, love, I didn't have consistency, I didn't have stability, neither, I didn't have someone holding my hand to support me as a young girl. That's why they're special to me. I can do my work here, I can empower them, I can support them, I can be here for them. Be that's why I come back that's why again, I come again, back again to make again, sure that make they, sure get content, they, they get content, content they, they get content, love, they get love, they get exposure, they get, exposure, they get visibility, uh, they, get uh, they get credibility uh, they get as well. Credibility and then ultimately, and then ultimately everything uh, will need to be to employability, which is profitability at one stage, they're going to make money. And hopefully, if they go back home or the political situation changes in many, many ways, at least they have something to hold on to, which are skills, which are technical skills I'm trying to give them. The I'm the Code vision is really to train, really to train one, million one million women and girls to learn how to code. And we would like to create the future digital leaders, digital intelligent young women, for them to become entrepreneurs, the innovators of tomorrow, the, the conquerors, of, tomorrow, the conquerors, the conquerors of, tomorrow, of the world of innovation, of the world of innovation and technology. technology. That's what I am the Code is about, and that's the mission. And that's the mission. I am the Code, I am the Why? Okay? I see the video, I cry. <laughs> so that's Nigok from South Sudan. <laughs> that's Nigok, she's beautiful. Right, so let me go my slide. Thank you so much. I, I want everyone to pay um, attention uh, in what I'm about to say, because this moment we have right now in this room, it's a very 
important moment for us as a, as a continent, but also is a milestone uh, that we have achieved. When I do things in the continent, I don't think about myself, but I think about uh, where we started as a continent and where we are going now. So I will talk to you about I Am The Code, which I had the privilege to uh, found it in, in 2016, but I will tell you why I found it I Am The Code and where we are today. So the video you saw right now is a video of young women and girls who are growing up right now in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And if you don't know, in Africa right now, we have, uh, especially in Kenya alone, we have over 600,000 refugees uh, who are living in two different camps. The first one in Dadaab, where 97% of the people that live in that camp are refugees from Somalia. And the rest of the camp, the, the other one is Kakuma. Again, another 250,000 people lives there. Girls are from South Sudan, Burundi, Kinshasa, and we have now girls from Ethiopia. So it's really, uh, you know, a, a terrible, a terrible situation for our continent. And I think we as Africans must think twice now if we really want to have those refugees in those camps. So let's think about that. But the girls are now coding and they're doing amazingly well. We'll go through the slides. So I, I founded I Am The Code in 2016 out of frustration. And most of you probably have seen my background. I didn't go to school. I'm standing here today, uh, I'm standing here today as the Chief Sustainability Officer uh, for I Am The Code. And I was like, I said, I'm the lucky founder of I Am The Code. And I created I Am The Code because I wanted to make sure young women and girls, and boys as well, have access to skills. They need to have skills. If they don't have skills, it's not gonna work. Then I decided to found I Am The Code and really focus on making sure we are focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And in 2013, I was lucky to sit in the room with global leaders at the United Nations. Everyone was talking about the Sustainable Development Goals ahead of 2015 before 193 countries, including Rwanda, rectifying the goals to make sure that, you know, we advance them. But we all know that without data and impact, we can't really uh, you know, show what we're doing as a continent. So I gave myself a very clear mission. Please pay attention to this data because in 2030, you'll hold me accountable for it. Pay attention to this data. It's a very serious data. And the data now is uh, backed by 37 companies, 27 governments across the world, including Nepal, Brazil, Argentina, Japan, and China. Really pay attention to this number because it's going to happen no matter what. It's my mission. And I'm calling right now for an emergency in this room. We are in a safe place. And eLearning Africa has put a, an amazing uh, you know, team together. But also people in the room who are professional uh, you know, people who understand what I'm saying. If you've been following the African ecosystem for the last 20 years like I do, you understand that right now we need emergency. I need to really pull the emergency button uh, for us to know. So I don't want to scare you but I'm calling right now for an emergency. And why I'm calling for an emergency? Time is critical. We are wasting time. We are wasting a lot of time as a continent. But also, we have issues as a continent with COVID-19. We also have seen what happened humanly. We have let people down. Young women and girls don't have access to content, to infrastructure, to connectivity. It is really bad, and we need to do something about it. So think about 1974, when I was born in Senegal, with no education until my teenage years, my early teenage years in the United Kingdom, where I was a cleaner working in bars and hotels and restaurants, trying to get myself an education. I couldn't get a job. So think about that now. I'm nearly 50 years old. I'm 47 years old today. My son is 21 years old. The reason why I like talking about time is for us to think about time. It's critical. If we don't do anything, time will pass anyway. So we need to do something now for our continent, for boys and girls all across the world. So think about time as you go along. Today, if you think about it, over 621 young people aged 15 and 24 are not in education. They're not in employment or in training. But we have spent so much money in Africa doing trainings and trainings and trainings. My country, Senegal, is a heaven of projects and trainings and certifications and go inside, coming back. It's time, we're wasting time. 75 million young people are trained, but they don't have any job. Why they don't have any jobs? Because they don't have any skills. 
No one will hire you if you don't have skills. It's just the truth. So I'm here to tell the truth and call the emergency button. One of the things I believe in my life is this. I'm not entitled to anything. No one owes me anything. But if you give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. What I'm trying to do across the world right now is to fix the issues, the failures we have. So having conferences like this where you all understand what I'm saying, we need to start helping people, by helping them meaningfully. The last mile of education must be funded now. Absolutely now. It's urgent. Fragmented education is destroying the life of boys and girls all across the world. Not just in Africa, but in the UK where I live today, in my comfortable home. But as an African, I'm a concerned African. I can't sit in my comfortable home in Guildford just watching the world burn. I can't do that. I've got a responsibility and a duty for society, but also for humanity. I'm trying to give back what the United Kingdom has given me, which is safety, a library where I can go and learn how to code seven coding languages. So I'm standing here, not an amateur on coding, I'm here as a full stack developer. So I build websites, apps, and I review codes every single day. So I really know what I'm talking about. But I did this because I didn't have Harvard degree, Oxford degree, Cambridge degree, all those fancy educations which are making Africans useless, if you ask me. Excuse my language. It is making us useless because we are not going to serve society. My mother's generation, my mom is dead. I don't know my father. But one thing is clear. The next 50 years, the refugee girls who will be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old need us, the Africans, the intellectuals, the connected, the privileged, the wealthy people, the educated ones to have, to not make our people the leftovers or the have not. It's not necessary because we have lands, we have resources, we have intellect, we have connections. In this room, the collective connections and wealth we have is probably over $2 billion. From my connection to yours. So let's think about that. Skills equal money. Young women and girls growing up across the world need to have skills. If they don't have skills, they will not earn any money. There is no sense of entitlement. People will not give them jobs. Amazon will come to Kenya, will come to Rwanda. If people are not skilled, they will not give girls jobs. My purpose in life is to educate, transform, and inform. I am sitting in a very powerful position today, very privileged compared to where I come from 47 years ago. But 47 years from now, if I'm no longer on this earth, you will never forget this moment. You will never forget this moment of humanity, of kindness, of compassion, empathy for our people and for the planet. It is our responsibility to take care of our people all over the world. You don't need to be a politician to do that. You just want to be a kind, compassionate, empathetic person to do it. Like me traveling all the way from Kakuma Refugee Camp because I'm a concerned African. Teaching young people how to code can improve our economies. You are all talking about sustainable development goals in your work every single day. But we need to start giving people decent work. When I see companies coming to Africa, using our coders, paying them $200, $500. It's an insult for our continent because we spend time training these people. You go to Uganda, one of the first tech hub I created in 2012, we have coders sitting down there. But we need to pay them decent money. We need to pay young people decent money. Google and Facebook are paying people a lot of money. So when a young boy and a girl in Africa have skills, let's pay them decent salaries. Because when a young woman has got money, she helps her communities, her mother, her father, and wealth we know must be equal. 
So I'm trying right now to promote youth employment, education and training. We have to give young people jobs. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is the, the language we use. I've been thinking the last couple of days here, the language we use when it comes to coding and technology and innovation and, and, and uh, digital literacy and you name it. I sit at the World Economic Forum, I, a very privileged position I have where I look into the taxonomy of education and how do we work with government, the private sector, to make sure we use the languages we need to make sure we are creating the jobs of tomorrow. Young girls need creativity. They need critical thinking. You can see the Kakuma girls, how smart they are. They're refugees. But being a refugee is not written on your back. Like being an abused child like I was. It's not written on my back. If I didn't share my story today, you wouldn't know. You saw me wandering around with my blue dress and my glasses and my rings and my hair. You think I just made it here. No, I didn't. It took me years to heal as a young girl. A years to be this passionate, this powerful speaker and an excellent person. It took years. So we can really make sure young girls and boys growing up across the world are excellent in what they do. Excellent in what they do. We have the black excellence. We start promoting our people. I sit at the reskilling platform at the World Economic Forum where we have a target of 1 billion people by 2030. This is a very, very important data. And next week, I'll be at Davos to beg leaders to really think about how can we do this together. Data matters. I am data today. Because I was not part of the census of the Senegalese. I was not part of the Senegalese data in 1980s, 1990s. I didn't have a birth certificate. So it's very important we sort out the issues as we go along and talk about tech and innovation. I go to Kakuma refugee camp because it's a shame for Africa. It is a shame for Africa. 600,000 people living in a heat in a desert, one meal a day, one cup of tea in the afternoon, as Tony said, I could, I am the food so young girls can eat. If you don't have something to eat, your brain doesn't work. I used to have one meal a day in Senegal. And now I have plenty of food in my supermarket. My son is privileged, young, mixed race child sitting in the UK, eating takeaways and sugary food because he doesn't know anything about poverty. But my young girls in Kakuma don't eat. They do not eat. So if when you don't eat, your brain don't work. There are girls, there's no planet B, it's only one single planet. So we can pretend that Kakuma don't exist or refugees don't exist until tomorrow, but it does exist. That's why I am a concert African going and helping my people. They are the first girls in the world in a refugee camp setting settlement to learn how to code. Because I know eight years from now, 10 years from now, when we go at the United Nations together in 2030, when I'm telling the world, I taught girls how to code, they will be standing sharing their stories. I know that for a fact. I can visualize 2030, eight years from now. I'll be 56 years old. So the girls are planting trees. They're looking into the climate change issues. They've got over 100 trees right now they're planting in this course. I bought them uniforms. I don't call myself an African philanthropist. It's a bit arrogant. But I'm a concerned African who's using her wealth, her power, her influence to go and educate, inform, and transform. The refugees are refugees today. But by the time I finish, they'll become coders. And you will hire them because I am building right now one of the Africa's largest pipeline for coders that is linked to humanity, kindness, and compassion. And this is the right moment now before I finish. I've taken too much time. I want to now tell you the gift I'm giving to our continent. You all have been struggling during COVID-19. But if you don't have content, you don't have connectivity, you don't have infrastructure, we are wasting time. As I said, time is critical. So the gift I'm giving to our continent today is the 12 weeks blended learning content that has 
global goals, life skills, and soft skills. And we have launched the IMDco digital platform where now you can go and learn how to code. You can now go and learn how to code as of today for free. You don't pay for anything. This is the platform I built. It's almost like the Coursera for Africa. You can now go and learn the four coding languages. Having e-learning pl platforms don't teach people how to code. We must stop funding e-learning platforms that don't have content for coding. So this is the e-learning platform. This is the digital platform I launched for young girls and boys to learn how to code. You can go and download the app and we can talk about this later on. And everything is focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I want to finish uh, just by saying, thank you, Minister. Thank you, everyone. I am a very passionate, concerned African. I'm extremely privileged to be here giving you a keynote. But it is absolutely crucial that I leave you with this takeaway. You must be a concerned citizen. And when you are a concerned citizen, you embed this with, comp with compassion, kindness, and empathy. You will go and transform the world. Because in 2030, you and I will meet at the United Nations, and you will ask me, Lady Mariam, have you taught one million women and girls how to code? My answer will be yes. Thank you so much. Thanks. Wow, that was a amazing. What a, what a terrific start to the morning. Thank you so much for your work, uh, Lady Miriam. I'd now like to invite um, and Thelma Fua Kwe. And Thelma, you're welcome to speak from there or up here, just to let you know. And uh, I love it that you're an ardent believer in the future of Africa. Love that. That you head the Digital Infrastructure and Capacity Building Division of the Smart Africa Secretariat, a pan-African organization based in Kigali, Rwanda, with a membership of 32 countries across Africa. Among other activities of what she does is harmonization of policies and creating strategies in the area of digital infrastructure, data protection, regulation, cybersecurity, capacity building for member countries across Africa. That's quite a bit, uh, Thelma, that's amazing. So I'd like to now invite Thelma, would you like to join us and give us your comments? Thank you. Give a round of applause. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Lady Mariam. I think that was a really, really passionate speech. I'm truly inspired, and I'm sure everybody here is inspired. Um, Honorable Minister of ICT and Innovation in Rwanda, Madam Paula Ngabire, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, before I go on, I'd like to ask the technical team to help me with a video from the Director General and Chief Executive Officer of Smart Africa Secretariat. Um, he sent his apologies. He would have loved to be here. And so he has asked for us to play this video. So please go ahead. Thank you. Honorable Minister of ICT and Innovation of Rwanda, Minister Paula Ingabire, distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. I'm delighted to speak to you all and would have wished to be with you in person today, but could not due to unavoidable circumstances. Allow me to congratulate organizers for this e-learning conference and for it being in the 15 editions, despite all that happened in the past two to three years due to pandemic COVID. One of the foremost projects in Smart Africa is about education and supporting needy students around Africa to pursue higher education in technology. And this goes to show how central we see the role of education playing in the digital transformations of Africa. Before I go on, I'd like to introduce you to what Smart Africa is all about. Smart Africa is an alliance of 32 ambitious and progressive African countries, international organizations, and global private sector player tasked with advancing Africa's digital agenda. The Alliance is empowered by a bold and innovative commitment by African head of the state 
to accelerate sustainable social economic development on the continent and to usher Africa into the knowledge economy through affordable access to broadband and ICT. At the heart of our visions to create a single digital market in Africa by 2030 lies the need to skill and reskill the continent's present and future workforce. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal emphasizes this urgency in its education's target for 2030. These goals include, among others, full access to high quality schooling from early childhood through secondary, equitable access to affordable technical, vocational, and territory educations, and more investment in education facilities to improve learning environment. At the moment, we have at Smart Africa about 32 projects ongoing, but I'll speak and focus more on five of them, which are essential to achieving the education goal in the effective and efficient manner. Number one, the ICT blueprint for skills, developments, and capacity building in education, a flagship of the Republic of Burkina Faso, the blueprint analyzes the current ICT in education status of the continent and formulate recommendations to improve the outcome of the ICT in schools. We are disseminating this blueprint to governments across Africa to help its mainstream technology in education. Number two is the Smart Africa Digital Academy currently implemented across seven countries. SADA is, uh, as we call it, is a dynamic Pan-African learning ecosystem in which African citizens at all age can acquire and improve their digital skills, acquire qualifications and meet the emerging talents need of employers. Industry or be, rely or be self-reliant Till date, we have trained close to 2,000 policy and decision makers from across 26 countries in Africa and looking to do more. Number three is the Smart Africa Scholarship Program. This is the project that has uh, so far sponsored about 82 students across the continent to pursue higher education in technology related fields. Till date, we have been able to raise 1.6 million US dollars and seeking more to support the growth of technology. Number four, the Smart Africa Giga Project. In collaboration with the ITU and the UNICEF Global Giga Project to connect every school in Africa to the internet. Number five, it's a Smart Broadband 2025 strategy, a transformative broadband strategy for Africa towards accelerating sustainable broadband penetrations in Africa. The future of Africa, our prosperity, depends on our capacity to innovate and become more competitive on the global stage. We cannot achieve this unless we are as technically literate as the other competing nations and continent. This task, our education's ecosystem to develop a greater engagement with industry, for example, through public-private partnership, and generate the required knowledge and innovations. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to meet the SDG for education challenges, Africa needs a continued and expanded public-private commitments of resources and increased leadership effort to encourage innovations in technology. We need to put in place an enabling digital environment, overcome the challenges of the traditional system of learning, and allow the various impactful way to implement technology in education. I thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to present this keynote and allow me to hand it over to my colleague Thelma to share some of the exciting initiative engaged on the continent. Wishing you a very productive session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the attention. So um, one of the key things that Mr. Lassina Kone said was this. 
He said, the future of Africa, our prosperity depends on our capacity to innovate and become more competitive on the global stage. We cannot achieve this unless we are as technically literate as the other competing nations and continent. And I believe this buttresses what Lady Miriam also said in terms of being able to capacitate the youth of Africa. There was a book that um, I read recently, The Bold New Normal, by a Pan-African called Lucy Quist. And one of the quotes I picked from that book says, and I, I quote, human potential is evenly distributed around the globe. The outcome is determined by what you choose to do with that potential. So that means that as much as, as Africans, we are not there yet in terms of our human capital index, the potential is there. And that's why, for me, I'm an ardent believer in the potential of Africa. And earlier on this week, I was, I was at a meeting and I mentioned the fact that the resource of Africa is not necessarily the gold or the cocoa that we have or the oil, it's the human capital. We have so much youth. We have, I mean, Africa accounts for 60%. Um, the youth account for 60% of the population in Africa. And this youth have so much potential. And how we handle this youth now will determine our future, our progress as Africa in the near future. I would like to um, tell you a story of a lady which really buttresses what uh, Lady Miriam had mentioned earlier on. So her name is Jemima. Um, I, I met her in 2017. She had uh, just completed the university, four years of university. Her dream was actually to become a software developer, but um, life had its own turns and she ended up being uh, a pupil teacher. Uh, that's like a basic great teacher. Um, and she had to take that up, not because she was passionate about it, but because she had to make ends meet. Life was really hard for her. Um, mind, mind you, this is somebody who had done computer science for four years and was out there looking for a job. Um, however, the <laughs> She had never seen a computer before. Then in 2018, there was the creation of um, a startup called Code Factory. Um, it's an institution that trains individuals on competency-based skills uh, when it comes to software development, as well as project management and other soft skills. So Jemima went through Code Factory for about nine months. And uh, after nine months, she was able to get um, an internship in one of the software developing companies in Ghana. And later on, after three months or so, she was able to get into full-time employment. Fast forward now, she's gainfully employed. She's very happy. And one of the practical things that you would see when you invest in women is that we pay it forward. So she started also paying it forward to her society, training girls in basic coding, teaching them how to be empowered, for instance. Uh, well, but girl empowerment is not why I'm here today. It's about the stillness of our education. I'm sure a lot of us here know too many Jemimas where they go to school, they go to university, they come out and they cannot find any job to do. Um, after four years of education, she came out and there was no relevant skills. I know there's no simple solution to it. We've been talking about it. And I like the, the emphasis, again, from my co-panelists on time. There's no time anymore. And so we need to take action as stakeholders in this room. I believe the stakeholders in this room have the power to create a better life for the Jemimas of this world. And as much as there is no simple solution, uh, before I sit, allow me to uh, pinpoint about four things that I think we can do. The first thing would be the political will. If there's no political will, we are not going anywhere. So for instance, there, is the, there, there are some countries that allocate some percentage of their budget 
to education. But we've seen that the traditional way of educate, educating is not giving us good quality. Um, UNESCO says that uh, about 80% of our youth are now in education, which is great progress. However, the human capital index in Africa is quite low. Why? It's because of the quality. I'll tell you again the story of Ghana, um, where the, the government had invested on a platform, an e-learning platform called iCampus, way before COVID, and uh, the usage was quite low. And just before COVID, the government was just about abandoning it, and then COVID hit. And then iCampus became very, very useful. So that's a clear example of um, political will and leadership. Um, as policymakers, we need to make sure we are prepared ahead of time. We don't need to wait for pandemics. We don't need to wait for um, the, the events that we, 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 we don't plan for before we plan. I mean, before we act, sorry. And then our curriculum. You know, I don't think it's so easy to decide that we are going to put a specific technology in our curriculum. As we know, curriculum changes very, very fast. So you may be teaching even a certain language today or a certain technology today, which may not be useful in five years' time. And so what I would propose is, can we now adapt a human-centered approach in our curriculum? Things that make our youth self-learners, lifelong learners, um, they are able to learn, unlearn, reskill themselves for the future, for instance. Then also the approach to learning. The third one is the approach to learning. Do we need to, to rethink our pedagogy, for instance? Should we still be instructional or collaborative? And uh, even when we pivot to e-learning, there's also the opportunity of students having an array of teachers they can choose from. Because if, I'm, if I want to learn data science, for instance, I can log in uh, online and choose which teacher I want, to, I want to learn from based on the style of teaching. So we need to rethink even the style of, of and our approach to learning and teaching as well. And then finally, um, I would close, close with saying that we need also to involve the private sector and the industry in creating content. If we don't in, in involve the private sector, the industry, we will have a lot of the Jemimas I met in 2017. However, if we want the Jemima of 2022, we need to be able to, close, to work closely with the likes of the Google, the Amazon, um, the local industry to, to ask them what are the skills that you need. And this approach has been um, tested and has been shown successful in, in Singapore where, for instance, they try to curate content for the next 20 years, not specifically on the technologies, but on the approach that students are able to absorb, learn, unlearn, and reskill themselves. So I, I'll close with this brief comment and say that there is definitely a way forward. Um, we need to be able to create more GMIMAs of 2022, and we look forward to a lot more of what Lady Jemima is doing. And when I sit uh, during the panel discussion, I'm going to be sharing more on what we are doing also at Smart Africa to address this problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thelma, that was terrific, and we're so glad that your director was able to join us as well. So compliments to the terrific uh, work of your organization. Um, our next speaker is Momo Bertrand, and Momo, again, great storyteller, love that, learning innovation team of the United Nations International Training Center, where you are a training and communication specialist with extensive experience in the United States, Europe, and Africa. Currently works at the International Training Center of the ILO, ILO, United Nations Agency based in Turin, Italy. Moma, it'd be terrific to hear your, your comments as well, and having noted earlier that the gender imbalance on the panel as well, and looking around this room and seeing how many motivated and passionate and powerful young women there are that are helping us move this continent forward. So Momo, please represent our gender. <laughs>
how can inclusive technology transform education in Africa? How can the wave of e-learning revolutions, you know, open the doors of education to every child and every learner on this continent? You see, today, if you take 100 children randomly, in most African countries, children aged about 10, and you write what I just said, 70 will not be able to understand. Learning poverty is a huge obstacle today on our continent. And, and we know that this is a problem because this is me and my mom. I don't know, I think I was 11 or 12 there. And, and I know that education opens doors because it has done this for me. My grandma didn't go to school. My mom had little education, but she invested so much in my education. And, and thanks to this investment, I was able to go to school in Cameroon, have a U.S. experience, and now work with the U.N. at the ITCILO in Torino. And, and my goal and my dream is really that every child on the continent should have the same opportunities that I had. But how do we make this possible? Here are five concrete ideas to accelerate access to education and also outcomes of education on the continent. The first is Africa is not a country. Africa is not a country. Africa is a diverse and rich continent with so much, so much nuances. And so it's not enough to translate an app from English to Swahili and think it's gonna automatically work in Kenya. It's not enough to change the icons of your app and give them a black skin and automatically it's gonna work in Cameroon. It is in critical to understand the nuances in every, continent, in every country on the continent. And even more importantly, we have to co-design and adapt education solutions to every community. And I'm not just talking about solutions that may come from the West to, to Africa. I'm also talking about solutions that can travel from one African country to another. So this is critical. Africa is, not a, 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 Africa is not a country, it's a continent. Number two, we have to invest in women-led solutions and promote equality in the field of e-learning. If you look at the data, women, young women, are 10% less likely to own a mobile phone in sub-Saharan Africa, and this is from 2018, maybe the data has changed. But let's realize that as we transition to, to the field of e-learning, the biases, the gaps don't go away. Actually, technology, if we are not careful, can actually amplify these gaps that exist. So we really need to be careful. And it's not just about you know, getting girls into the classroom. It's also making sure that girls have a seat at the table, women have a seat at the table when decisions linked to e-learning are being made. I'm thinking about amazing entrepreneurs like you know, Lady Mariam or Ariel Kitio, a Cameroonian PhD who launched an initiative to break girls' tech phobia. And she has helped hundreds of girls to get into tech through e-learning. So we, can, we need to invest in the Ariel Kitios in every country on the continent. And I think it is hypocritical to claim that we are pushing for girls' inclusion without ensuring that women actually have a seat at the table when decisions are being made. So we need to change this. And I love our panel because we have amazing women. And I love actually the balance. You know, we have to fix things. It has been the other way around for too long, so I think this is amazing. And the third thing is we need to avoid the SNS syndrome. Does anybody know what SNS syndrome is? Anybody? You want to guess? Nobody? Okay. It's the single negative story syndrome. You know, I was talking to some people uh, on a flight here, you know, um, from Torino to, to Kigali, and I was like, I'm going to this education conference, and he's like, oh, education in Africa. They don't have internet. They don't have computers. They don't, they don't, they don't. And I was like, dude, we can't just focus on what is not go going well in Africa. Let's also think about what is going well in Africa. There's, there's actually this quote of Obama that I love and that we can twist. There's nothing wrong in the education system of Africa that can't be fixed with what is right in the education system in Africa. So it's time to change the narrative. And this is critical. And, and this means looking at what Africa already has. Today, 495 million people have mobile phone subscriptions. Go back 20 years, and this is a radical you know, transformation. Today, as I'm speaking, we have 400,000 kilometers of underutilized fiber networks. And this is mostly owned by governments, and we can, we can envision a scenario where we liberalize the telecom industry, 
and we enable private sector partners to use, to share this um, infrastructure. This can lower the cost of data and bring a lot of opportunities for e-learning. So we have some assets, and we have thousands of education innovators, the Telmas, the Minister, you know, uh, the Lady Mariams, and all amazing innovators here who are already making a difference. Let us not keep, like, we, I am tired of hearing, okay, this is not working. What is working, and how can we amplify that? That is critical. You know, we are actually, uh, tonight I'm leaving the conference and going to South Africa, where the FIT Global Conference on the Elimination of Child Labor is happening. And we had a little issue. You know, child labor is a very heavy topic. But how can we speak about hope when we're talking about child labor? And we had a simple idea. Come up, with, uh, come up with a social media challenge where people have to do three things. Draw a smiley face on their hands, take a selfie, and post it on social media saying, I raise my hand for a world free of child labor, and add the hashtag, raise your hand for kids, and tag three people. In a matter of a week, we had like 4,000 people joining the challenge. And since I still have about uh, five minutes, I want to invite you to take the challenge now. If you have a pen, if you, draw, if you can draw a smiley on your hand, take a selfie, post it on social media right now. We give you like 60 seconds and say, I raise my hand for a world free of child labor, add the hashtag and tag triple, three people. So, go. <laughs> draw a smiley, okay, thank you. I see you. some people are already doing it. And this is important because we know that 160 million children are in child labor, and so it is critical that we take action. Draw the smiley, take the selfie, do the posting with the hashtag, raise your hand for kids, tag people, tag three people and say, I raise my hand for a world free of child labor. And you can do it with, your part, with the person who is sitting next to you. Just make sure you use the hashtag, raise your hand for kids. 20, 20 seconds again, 20 seconds. Thanks to everybody who's taking part and joining this movement for the rights of children. This is very important. 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, cinq, quatre, trois, due, uno, basta. Okay, thank you. You can also do the challenge after, but thank you so much for joining the movement. So it's, it's, it's always about changing the narrative. Thank you for raising your hand for kids. The fourth point is to put humans before technology. And I think the human-centered approach has already been mentioned here. But at the International Training Center of the ILO, where I work, one of our mantras is we want to design learning in the innovation interventions that are human-centered. So I think um, on the first day, a teacher from Kenya mentioned something very important, you know. Sometimes we want teachers to adapt to e-learning, you know, methodologies, but we don't consider them as partners. We are like, hey, you, start using Zoom. You don't consult the teachers. And I think it, we have to move away from this, you know, autocratic system and consider really teachers as partners in the digital transformation that needs to happen in schools. Also the parents, you know, I think it's funny that we as educators are trying to change the lives of students, but we forget to involve probably the most important person in the life of a kid, the parents. In Cameroon, for example, the, the president of the Parents Teachers Association is usually the second most important person in the school after the, the principal. So how can your interventions consider the role of parents and still being human-centered, not only parents, but the learners themselves and all the players that are around the learner? Let's put humans before technology. This is critical. And my final point is that inclusive learning is not just about access. So, you know, sometimes when you're talking about education, we're like, my platform has one million users. Yes, that's access. You've given access to one million people. But what, what are the outcomes? 10 years down the line, what, do they have, you know, decent jobs? Are they giving back to the community? And so I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially in the field of innovation in education, to explore also longitudinal studies to see the impact because there's a lot of buzz, you know, hey, the kids are going to go into this virtual reality room, it's going to be so cool, selfies and everything, but is it creating jobs? Big question. You, you can say, okay, we are going to train a visually impaired students, but then ultimately 
down the line? Are they able to get jobs? Do you provide some support? This is really critical. You know, at the ITCLO, we, we recently published uh, the Digital Inclusion and Adult Learning Guide. You can take a picture and download it later. But, but uh, let me just leave if you want to take a picture of this. Um, but one of the key things that we argue for, it's, it's not just about access. Give access, provide quality education, but also think about outcomes. Uh, we, we were having coffee with Thelma, and, and I think Anthony asked, what is wonderful learning for you? And some of us were like, oh, it should be entertaining and everything. And Thelma said something that really touched me. Wonderful learning is about being able to create decent jobs down the line. And in, and in an African context where decent jobs are so much needed, I think this is critical. So not just access, but also recognition and employability are critical. So, and, and, and one key thing that I, I think we should re really remember, and I'm, and, and I'm finishing now, is when you do reporting on the impact of your e-learning interventions, please disaggregate data not only on access, but also outcomes. Because sometimes we see that, okay, we have trained, you know, 1,000 people, we had gender equality, 500 boys but, and 500 girls, but the boys get jobs, but then the women or the girls still have face difficulties. So disaggregate the data when you report, this can help you also identify, you know, bottlenecks and adjust your interventions accordingly. I just want to close with, with two of my, my favorite quotes. The first is that education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world, and this is from Nelson Mandela. And, and the second is, is beautiful. I think it, it says, if, if you want to think in terms of one year, plant a seed. If you want to think in terms of 10 years, plant a tree. But if you want to think in terms of 100 years, teach the future generations. And my hope is that 100 years from now, our children's children would meet in Kigali, Rwanda, and they will say, we are celebrating 50 years of full quality education across the continent and across the world. And I think it starts with each and every one of us. Let's make universal education, quality education on the continent a reality for all. Let's raise our hand for every child. Thank you. Momo, that was great. And I can't imagine that individual on the plane that you had the conversation with wasn't absolutely convinced that he had the wrong idea by the time the plane landed. So we just have to send Momo around the world in planes with your passion and your articulateness for and terrific slides, which I hope we'll be able to make available as well to the presenters, so terrific job. Um, I now would like to invite the Honorable Minister, um, Paula Ingebere, Minister of IC, uh, tel, um, ICT and Innovation to provide some comments from where you're sitting, uh, Minister, as well, and maybe just to give a little of your background. You served as the head of the ICT Business Development Department of the Rwanda Development Board and coordinator of the Kigali Innovation City Project. You also worked as the Smart Africa Coordinator, an initiative that seeks to leverage broadband infrastructure to drive Africa's social economic growth. She's a graduate of MIT's School of Engineering and Sloan School of Management in System Design and Management and holds a BS in Computer Engineering and Information Technology from the former Kigali Institute of Science and Technology. We're delighted that you could join us and take some extra time to be with us today and look forward to your comments. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. I think as, as I was seated here for the last one hour, I've been trying to think how do I disrupt the flow of going to the front since this is meant to be uh, a panel conversation. But I thought what a better place to bring that disruption because as we talk about e-learning, uh, surely we're also thinking about disrupting uh, education system as it is today. So it's truly an honor and pleasure to be with you this morning uh, to share and learn uh, from the different speakers that have, you know, shared the very interesting work that you're all doing and uh, I was quite amazed uh, at, at the impact uh, that each one of you um, is working on. But just as we think through, and, and I see right there, um, what we have is really the session which is around how do we spread the benefit of education to everyone and more than ever, uh, thinking about the times that we live in uh, post-COVID-19 uh, uh, or during COVID, I think the one thing that we learned is that hybrid learning is probably here to stay. 
And I know this is, this is not new for everyone, especially for all of you that are here in the room today. Uh, but I think everyone, whether you're an educator, a teacher, a policymaker in the private sector, in the civil society, and at the core of your work is um, you know, uh, improving education and learning outcomes, improving access to education, affordability of uh, quality education, I know uh, in your various um, you know, responsibilities, uh, each one of you has always thought about what is going to be the role of technology in delivering quality education, in delivering uh, equal access to education. And I know there was a strong emphasis on this panel uh, as we talked about having um, you know, young girls uh, you know, having equal access to the different education opportunities. And so um, with that, I think even as we think about leaving no one behind uh, from a broadband infrastructure perspective, we can't afford um, to leave anyone behind when it comes to access to education. And I think technology, digital technologies, digital solutions provide that opportunity. But it's not obvious. It's not obvious because I think for many of us, uh, if we can relate to the various countries where we come from, a lot of effort has been put in putting in place the necessary uh, broadband infrastructure, whether it's connecting schools, whether it's connecting homes, whether it's connecting uh, uh, communities. And, but what you see is that there's still a big gap when it comes to usage, when it comes to how do we leverage and benefit from uh, this infrastructure that uh, has been put in place. And, and um, the story is not different, uh, even for Rwanda. And just to give you a bit of statistics, uh, we have over 95% uh, population coverage when it comes to 3G, over 97% for 4G, and this is population coverage, not geographic coverage. But when you look at the usage stat statistics, uh, it's staggering, it's glaring. Uh, you have about 29%. So you have so many people that live in areas of coverage, yet they're still not benefiting from that. And I think that's why the conversation that we're having today, listening to Lady Mariam, listening to Momo and Thelma, um, as everyone emphasizes you know, digital literacy, digital skilling, access to education, this is really uh, where the much needed focus and investments need to be made as we try to close on, on that usage gap. Um, as I was looking up some statistics, looking, uh, there's a report that IFC issued where you have over, and what it says is in the next decade, over 57 million jobs in the world will require digital skills. And when we talk about digital skills, uh, we're really talking about digit basic digital literacy skills. Uh, Momo di and, and uh, Lady Mariam uh, were talking about coding, but we're also talking about how many of our children, how many of our teachers, how many of our own people in our communities are able to use a device to access the information, to access the opportunities, whether it's a job, to access all these education um, um, opportunities that we have. I think all of us can relate with when we all first had our COVID cases in our various countries and most of the schools were struggling to ensure that they minimize the disruption that was happening around the school closures. So for private schools, it was a different story. If they had the infrastructure, the kids that are going to those schools can afford um, to be connected to the internet, can afford to go on Zoom and still engage with their teacher. But the story was different uh, when, when you're talking about public schools. And so for some countries, while they could not afford some of these tools, the, the best option uh, that, could, uh, that, that they could revert to uh, in the absence of uh, broadband connectivity, of devices, of skills, was learning through radio and TV. And what that means is that the, the learning outcomes, the learning gap that we've seen has probably doubled or tripled. Because if you have a student, think about it, your own child, who is going to learn uh, through radio, imagine how much is lost in that process. And, and so I think even putting on my policy making hat, um, uh, for us, it's been more, more than ever very evident that infrastructure is not enough. It's the skilling, but also what has been important is to understand that the heart of all of this is the teacher. I'll share with you an example. About 15 years ago, we started the One Laptop Per Child initiative here in Rwanda, and uh, we were you know, giving primary school kids uh, laptops to use. But the challenge for us immediately was evident because even the teachers who spent most of their time with their students 
did not know how to use this device. So there was really a huge gap in even ensuring that this device was being used uh, maximally. And so that's why for us we've pivoted to a focus where we're looking at really empowering the teacher first, building their digital literacy skills, ensuring that they have the basic and bare minimum digital literacy skills to use a device to deliver um, you know, their, 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 their lessons in the classroom, to prepare ahead of time. Um, and, and when we talk about it, it may seem, uh, uh, is this a nice to have thing? It's not a nice to have thing. Because if a teacher has had the time to prepare their material, and when they're in the classroom, they're not so much focused on rewrite, copying notes from a notebook and putting it on the blackboard for the students to copy them back, but rather they are focused on ensuring that whether it's a class of 60 students or 30 students or 90 students, that they are grasping the concepts because they've prepared that, they've projected it, and they're just trying to ensure that the classroom engagement is happening. So this is where we've shifted, and we, we, there are many partners. Uh, we have ITU and UNICEF that are championing a global initiative called GIGA. I'm sure most of you have already heard of it. It's really around school connectivity. And not just looking at infrastructure, it's looking at digitizing um, uh, the curriculum, dig digitizing the learning material, empowering teachers with the right skills and the right tools, uh, and ensuring that when they deliver uh, their classes, it's an engaging um, uh, and, and, and engaging collaboration with the students. Um, about three weeks ago, because we've, we are one of the, um, uh, the, 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 the lighthouse countries for GIGA, so we've uh, piloted the GIGA initiative in, one, in about 63 schools here in Rwanda. So about three weeks ago, we visited some of these schools. And, and, and this is the power of knowing that you shouldn't wait to get it all perfect to start rolling out this program. It's almost figuring out what do I have at hand, let me deploy and I'll learn al along the way and we'll figure out how to uh, perfect um, uh, the impact and the outcomes that you were talking about, Momo, that we would all be looking for. And what became very obvious because we were shifting from should we have two smart classrooms per school and what does that mean? It's having two classrooms that are equipped with the uh, uh, computers, internet connectivity, and you're guaranteeing that uh, for every student within a week at least they will interact uh, with this infrastructure at least four to five hours a week. And so we're pivoting from that and saying if we're putting the teacher at the center of this, uh, using the holidays, using the school closures that happened during uh, COVID-19 to teach them, to give them basic digital literacy skills, digitizing the curriculum as much as we can, helping them to prepare material using the devices that they've been provided, what more do we need to do? And so as we, as we visited these schools and looked at how it, the, it has been exciting, how the teachers were feeling excited that they were, they've been empowered, uh, and right now they can focus more on the classroom experience, then we realized maybe we shouldn't even just be thinking about broadband infrastructure, laptops, digital literacy. What other devices do they need? Should we have a projector? We also have a blackboard. What is the interface of some of these things? And so I'm sharing this story just to share with you what our journey has been as we, um, you know, we thought about how do we integrate digital technologies to improve learning outcomes, to improve the teaching experience, to improve uh, the learning experience. And this is just at the classroom level we still have a lot of work to do. Because now, when students go back home, then what? Um, and, and, and that's the journey that all of us are taking as, um, you know, uh, as a country, as, as countries that are represented here, to say that yes, once you get it right for the classroom experience, and students do get home, are we, how are we thinking about last mile connectivity? Is it affordable? Uh, do, do households that are living below the poverty line, what, what unique and innovative and affordable solutions do we put out at their disposal? What learning centers do we put in the communities for families that still will not be able to afford this so that at least uh, within a community there's a space uh, that students can actually go to and still be able uh, to learn? And I think one thing we can all agree with in this room is that a lot of learning will also happen outside the classroom. We don't always, and, and just yesterday actually, I was meeting about three young um, you know, coders. They, they're really self-taught, and, and I like the platform that you're developing, uh, Lady Mariam, and really going to have to mobilize our own people to benefit from it. And I was impressed to see that a lot of what they've done over the last three years is self-teaching. It's having access to platforms like the one Lady Mariam is launching and making sure 
on a daily basis, they're learning a new skill, they're testing it, it's hands-on, they're trying it here and there. And today, they are great developers. They're people that you can employ, and most of them are even um, uh, are not even halfway through their university degrees. And so it is our responsibility, and really to echo what everyone else was saying here on the panel, um, as I close off with my remarks, it's our responsibility um, to do that last mile extension of education beyond the classroom uh, because as we think about disrupting, it's not just disrupting the current education system, it's really providing this extension that is so much needed uh, to encourage um, uh, uh, self-learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. And again, what a beautiful partnership with your passion and insight into education, working with your colleagues in other ministries as a model of demonstration to avoid silos, but to have ministries working with each other. So clearly, your passion in education and keeping the teacher at the center and the child, as opposed to the technology, I'm sure resonates with those of us who have been working in this field for such a long time. Well, we've come to the end of it. We want to turn the opportunities. We're going to conclude the formal sessions, so you have a few minutes to have particular questions with the panelists before they leave. But I want to say, as the chair of this panel, it's every panel chair dream to simply have an amazing panel of captivating and compelling speakers. So I'm not going to be embarrassed to say this to the other chair people who are in here. I had the best panel. And maybe a round of applause. And please uh, join us up here to ask questions of our panelists. And thank you, panelists, again, for your contributions.